the MRL. Uh, to get to know the people here, but also get to know how the solution has been working in practice. So I want to thank you all so much. I had a little bit of time last week to sit down with me and say a few words on what you're doing. Uh, so it's been very valuable to take back to Sweden. Uh, and also happy that actually I get to do some work here so at least present some of our experience, experience on the Swedish energy policy as a way to give back. And uh, another token of appreciation, appreciation, I actually got some cinnamon, Swedish cinnamon rolls that I made. I don't know if it's going to be enough. <laughs> uh, so I think and you don't have to eat them. I mean, if you don't like them, you have to eat them. It's okay. Don't be offended. And um, this also is just like a presentation. At least you get something out of it. I'll <laughs> well, see how much that. Well, sorry for that. End of the whole thing. Sorry guys, I'll make it next to more for next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I think today I'm just going to go back and show you the, the structure of uh, the presentation. Uh, I think it will last about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, and I think maybe it's best if you, in the end, if you have any questions or thoughts, I mean, maybe we can take it in the end. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, First, starting with some basic information about Sweden, so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, uh, then I will go back and say, uh, look at the last four decades uh, and show you how the Swedish energy system uh, developed. Uh, and then go into a little bit more on which policies, some of them, the most important, which were behind this transformation of the energy, Swedish energy sector. Uh, then I uh, would like to look at like, what are the policy objectives looking we are working on towards today, and I also say a few words on a historical political agreement that was reached in June this year, which hopefully uh, setting policy policy or policy objectives for the next four decades, uh, which is something uh, which we have waited for for a long time. Then I will make a little side step. Uh, I will speak uh, a little bit about how the EU works. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good opportunity as well as the member states of the EU to actually say how does it work. And I would correct that as well, a lot more focus on EU and what's happening on there. So I just give you the basics. Uh, and then also say a few words on um, the EU Energy Union, which is now the, the big thing over overseas. Uh, and then finally, I will say a few words on global energy engagement. Uh, which connects to the Smoker Center. And then finally, say a few words on, on, on Sweden, the Swedish government, and NLL population. <coughs> so, this is probably the most important picture of today. <laughs> so, uh, when you travel, when you leave Sweden, <laughs> it happened in Denver when I came here as well uh, a few weeks ago. That when I called them up to Sweden, I said, oh, the amazing thing must know so many languages. And I was like, what? I <laughs> Oh, well, maybe this person knows a lot about the Swedish education system. <laughs> I didn't do it at the first moment. I thought, well, I know uh, I'm mean, English, I'm, I'm Danish, I'm Norwegian. She looked at the puzzle with me like she wasn't really impressed, but I mean, I would take it out. <laughs> so we do have mountains and good chocolate, but we're not Swedish um, <laughs> And But no grief if you're not using us, there's no problem. It would be worth it to mix it up with Norway or Denmark. <laughs> Uh, GDP per capita, GNE, like the 
measuring it if it's the income inequality. That's a potential measure of 5.4, but it's apparently low. Uh, HI, uh, human development index, is also pretty high. Because on the unemployment the average of other European countries, uh, we have uh, about 26% of the population has higher education, and it was 11% back in 1990, so uh, a good increase. And so you can see there's a lot more women uh, in higher education than that. And 89% uh, speak English as uh, a second language, is also pretty high internationally. And uh, a few other who would like to dance around the maple every now and then, but <laughs> we also have a few other things. I'm proud of I'm proud of this, but we we so have a, a parental parents can take about two four hundred eighty days of parental leave together. Uh, with the free admission of tuition to universities, uh, the low cost childcare, and what we'll speak more about today. I mean, have almost uh, fossil fuel free electricity and heating sector. Uh, we do also have the highest share of McDonald's per capita in Europe. Congrats to you. And then we have a history of a lot of, um, well, uh, industries. So uh, here are a few of them. Probably the biggest one, and the latest, of course, also now. Sky, the Spotify, Texas, Park, the Swedish, is also a Danish, and so many guys, but Spotify is Swedish. Well, uh, coming up to the energy part, <laughs> but just a few, mention a few things, a few words on U.S. Sweden relations. So we actually had our first, the only colony, one of the only colonies we had it was back in 1638. It was established New Sweden in Delaware. Uh, you can see some traces of it today. Um, if you travel around in eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, or southern uh, New Jersey, you also know that well, in Philadelphia a few years ago, an area like Flag of the City is blue and yellow. Uh, I think that might be most. As I mentioned before today, we are a country of immigration. Uh, we were definitely a country of emigration uh, back in the, in the 19th century. Uh, so third of our population left, and a lot of the of course, North America. Uh, it's in fact as well that Chicago was the second biggest Swedish city in 1910, uh, bigger than <coughs> So, and then for on US-Swedish relations, so I had a both well, between 1961 and 1987, and there were no Swedish prime minister invited to the White House, the Swedish Commission. But the political relations have been there, have been there, have been improved a lot since then. I think today we're very close political and economic power. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of Americans with a Swedish uh, background as well, like David, Charles Johansson, Jill and Hall, Christian Lockerson. <laughs> and then a few guys can be here as well. <laughs> and even I was through that pretty, I mean, I don't like my, my grandmother's mother, all her siblings left Sweden. She was the only one left, so she probably, she could have left them as well, and then I would have sat here. Uh, uh, yeah. And finally, uh, that was to, to Colorado. We also had Peter Forsberg, <laughs> uh, which of course just played for the app for many years. And nowadays it's actually another Swedish, Swedish uh, now this book is captain of the house, so it's also still contributing to the U.S. Uh, to the relations. Uh, okay, now if you want to hear to talk about. So, I will now go back to, to, uh, to speak to you about the development of the Swedish energy system uh, from the, the 1970s to today. And we used to be one of the most oil dependent countries in Europe. Uh, so but back in the 1970s, we had an oil crisis. This was a broad political agreement to change that uh, situation. So uh, there was a, a strong push to reduce the dependency of oil products in the electricity and heating sector. Uh, and this slide, you can see, uh, well, of course, the nuclear was built up in the 70s and 80s, and also you see a growth in in bioenergy. And uh, so this, this, this slide shows as well this is the primary energy, so the 
the, the weight gain from eucalyptus here as well. So the total of things, if you look at the MGUs, today is about 370 terawatt hours. And about 40% of that is from the residential service sector, 40% of the industrial sector, and 20% is domestic and transport. Uh, I will now just show you a glimpse of these different sectors in the development. As you can see here, in the residential and service sector, we have seen a major reduction of all products. Uh, and we're seeing an increase in the of use of electricity, of distributing, and an increased number of heat pumps. Uh, so the actual use of oil products has been reduced from 70 percent to with 70% in the residential sector. Look at the in, in industry sector, and we are definitely an industry uh, independent country, but also saying that an energy intensive country with a lot of awful paper, steel, production, mining, etc. So it's uh, it, it, sure uh, to secure supply to the industry sector, I think, very important for the economy. But the economy or the industry rules of course uh, during the 70s and all prices. So even in the industrial sector, we saw a great uh, push for biomass. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an increase by from 21 percent to 38 percent during the last four decades. And seeing more biomass in the industry is mostly fuel fuel and black liquor. Uh, so we see in total uh, a drop from 48 percent of oil products to 7 percent. But then the main challenge, uh, I think, is the transport sector. We have, uh, so when we're speaking about our challenges to combat climate change, we still have a lot of uh, emissions or oil dependency in the transport sector. Uh, and what you should say in this picture is that at least the last year you see a drop in uh, Energy, energy use in the transport sector. Uh, the big large transport sector is road, rail, aviation, and shipping. So that's cool. um, but also interesting is that we have back in 2012, 60% of the cars, 65% of new cars were diesel cars. Uh, there have been a lot of pushes from the government to try to do you know, ethanol. Uh, back in 2005, 2006, to raise the uh, amount of cars with ethanol, a lot of subsidies, but uh, due to the challenges with supplies, and we have been having this discussion within the EU last year on sustainability for sharing of biofuels, we want to kill the market, so this is that, that's the pity, but we've seen at least the last year a growth in the use of electric cars and PNG. This is a challenge that remains. I just want to show you also uh, two more pictures about the development of the energy sector. This is this actually showing capacity. I mean, if you look at the production, the, the actual use, uh, you can almost say that high percent of 40 percent, near 40 percent uh, combined heat and power, 10 percent of wind, maybe 7, 8 percent. But looking at this whole capacity. Uh, you can see that high risk dominant uh, and the wind, we have a lot of wind as well. And I'll come back to this as uh, actually it's one of our challenges at the moment. Uh, this picture doesn't show it, but so we have 10 react nuclear reactors in Sweden. Four of them will close within the next four years. So we lose a lot of capacity in the, in the, in the system. So this is one of the challenges which I'm actually going to come back to later say how the government is dealing with. Uh, and it is also kind of, I won't say it's unique for Sweden, but we have a big district heating sector, uh, which is it's not the same in the US, but in some European countries, in especially Eastern Europe, and some Nordic countries have, or have cold winters. Uh, uh, since the 50s, we built up a, a this heating sector in many cities, but the important to say here is it's 50% uh, biomass or 80% waste heat. So a lot of Swedish cities you might say find uh, combined heat 
power plants, which are fueled by municipal waste. Uh, so this has led to that we have a we have a we have a great demand, uh, excess demand for uh, waste, which now we import waste from Norway to be able to get heating for our homes. Which not that it's a bit of a discussion on are actually sustainable, but it's the way that it's actually managed to transform waste into heating for, for well. Uh, so you can also see here that a lot of the homes were before heated by oil products, but now it's mostly uh, through uh, distributing and heat pumps as well have, have reduced the demand of <coughs> So this is also just an overview of the development. So what are the important policies behind the transformation? Uh, I would name the most important ones, it's about eight. I will first say, speak a little bit about the Nordic electricity market, which is kind of becoming a, especially in the Europe, in the EU, uh, we more focus on regional cooperation. As you look at the difference between different parts of the EU, so the regional cooperation becomes more uh, relevant. So the Nordic cooperation has been there for a long time, but we have, we all think they regulated our market back in the 1990s. So Norway was first, I think Sweden, we did it in 1996, which means that competition follows separation, production, and distribution, uh, and sales. Uh, but also competition, so we have competition today on production and sales, but then still transmission and distribution breaks our monopoly. Uh, but this will develop a common, so the sales are happening at this joint common power exchange, which is called Nordpool. Uh, and this established back in the 1990s and it was from relating Norway and Sweden, but then the other Nordic countries joined the North now also the Baltics, uh, not Latvia, but Lithuania and Estonia. So what I read is that 85% of all the electricity that is produced are traded through this, this exchange. Uh, also to show you the little feeling for the grid system, so quite integrated, uh, and during the last year it's also built a lot of new interconnection. This will actually finish this winter between Sweden and Lithuania and uh, help the Baltics be integrated in the Nordic system rather than being uh, still part of the old former Soviet system. But being part of this regional electricity market. Uh, so key inter interconnection is, is very important. So, and when we had a discussion, me and my colleagues, uh, about security of supply, if you speak about self-sufficiency, it's not longer speaking about self-sufficiency within the borders of Sweden. It's actually having a belief that the whole market should work. And that's how it comes to have a lot of hydropower up here, wind power down here, and then we have all biomass, and also, of course, a number of your other thermal uh, sources. But the idea is to have one integrated and consumer market. Uh, and now we have food food which is also. And uh, this is kind of a, I'm not an expert, and I think it's very complicated to understand the electricity market, because I also showed you on the last slide, we don't have one electricity tribe in Sweden. Uh, so we actually have four electrical zones. <laughs> so as I was saying, we have all the production up here, with the big rivers, and then we have consumption down here. <coughs> uh, the nuclear reactors which are around here as well to do like with that. So how can we this actually part of the integration of development of the internal EU energy market or the electricity market that the commission told us you cannot have one pricing zone in Sweden. So you have to you have to divide into two or four different zones, four different zones for different prices, and the prices, different prices should be the incentive for uh, investing in production and transmission. Uh, so, saying down here is the prices are probably higher than up here. So that, that is the model uh, we're using. Uh, energy and carbon taxes, I think carbon taxes is something that is, of course, always on uh, it's very relevant to discuss uh, ahead of Paris, but after Paris, well, how can we use these kind of instruments to actually 
uh, generalized cost of uh, different energy sources. Uh, so there's a few things maybe I want to up our experience. Uh, energy taxes are electricity and other fuels, but the CO2 tax which was introduced back in 1991. It wasn't just a standalone reform, this was part of the major electric power problem of this biggest tax digital reform ever. Uh, so raising taxes on energy and CO2, but then also lowering income taxes, property taxes, um, uh, and it's been successful, and it's another takeaway is that this is a gradual raise, and you should start low, uh, and then you raise it over time. So I think it was a lot of uh, criticism from industry in the beginning, but nowadays there's still some criticism, but it's, uh, it's broad support from multiple parties, uh, but also think from uh, others that the raise value actually pushing the industry to uh, become really like more sustainable. Uh, another takeaway is that, um, yeah, if you divide it, I mean, everyone is different on household services uh, compared to industry and agriculture. So the green certificate system is another, which uh, it has been our instrument to raise the share of renewable for the last 15 years. A lot of countries show us uh, feeding tariffs, Nowadays, it's a lot of focus on uh, power versus women. Uh, back in 2002, there was a decision to introduce this support scheme, uh, which is a market-based uh, support scheme, which uh, provides uh, uh, suppliers, some end users actually buy a certain number of certificates of renewals, uh, and this is an incentive for producers to actually uh, sell or invest in, in, in uh, in renewables. So even as a it, so one certificate is one megawatt hour and uh, what we saw in the beginning that always most cost efficient uh, solutions that will come in will add on the grid. So first we saw a lot of uh, uh, renewable THP and now during the last ten years we've seen a lot of uh, wind power. So actually wind power I would say that uh, wind power has increased from one terawatt hour to 15 or 16 terawatt hours of our energy consumption. And uh, I think, not to, not to brag, but it's more than Denmark. So it's often more famous for the wind power. Um, but we are, of course, not the uh, So the green certificate system uh, has been very useful, not promoting certain technologies, but for purposes of Increasing the rate of the share of renewable and the target now, which we're happy I with Norway, which is common market base, is another 28.4 terawatt hour to 25. Uh, finally, of course, I mentioned, I mean, to move away from the, the oil dependence back in the 70s, 80s, it was important to build the nuclear reactors. Uh, not saying it's not a sensitive issue. Um, a lot of heat pump installation of subsidies. There are a lot of different programs supporting biofuels and biogas, and also environmentally friendly cars. Uh, also, energy efficiency is it's more complicated. Uh, than we have to produce uh, new uh, electricity or heating. Uh, so you really need like cross cross society uh, programs. Uh, we work a lot with regional and local actors, different information programs. So now there's uh, Government, central government is funding like, energy and climate advisor in each of the 280 municipalities in Sweden. Uh, but otherwise, when it comes to energy efficiency, we're a lot dependent on common EU directives, like legal act. Uh, so we have setting certain requirements on audit for industry, on public uh, institutions, etc., on building codes. Uh, we also have to equally tight energy labeling, which is setting like standards, requirements for different products. Um, I will also say when third world speak about not only energy policy, but also other policies, like the environmental code. Uh, so I think for that, what I mentioned before about the increased use of waste uh, for uh, generation to heat, the ban of dumping of combustible waste and organic waste, that uh, certainly will have to uh, uh, incentive to, to use it in other ways. Also different air 
requirement, the land use requirement also uh, be important for developing the energy sector. The research and innovation, uh, I think that is also a key uh, uh, like a part of the component in the transformation of the energy sector. We have had uh, research, energy research programs since the 1930s and degree. Uh, this is the last program, so also I'm not gonna, well, compared to Denmark, Denmark has more uh, technology focus. They think like wind power is going to be world leading in wind power, we're going to be world leading in uh, CHP. But the funding of two different programs in Sweden is always on the system level. So historically we have kind of few that will technology focus to the board programs. But we're looking at the system around certain challenges. Uh, finally, I also want to mention that sustainable and forest management have also been crucial uh, in the development of the Swedish bioenergy sector. So that is, the bioenergy sector to hydro probably the most important energy source. Uh, and it wouldn't have been possible to expand the bioenergy sector. It wouldn't have the sustainable forest management. So today, actually, I think even if we have, have increased use of bioenergy, biomass, radically, we still have more trees in total today than we have in 50 years ago. Um, okay, so that's the path. Um, now looking ahead, uh, what are objectives are we, me and my colleagues, now working towards? Uh, so back in, actually this is part of this slide, but just to recap, so back in 2007, uh, the Prime Minister President of the EU member state met and decided upon the EU 2020 objectives, which say like by 2020, EU should re reduce emissions by 20%, we should have 20% renewables in our energy mix, and the energy consumption will be 20% more efficient compared to 2008. So this was then later transposed to every member state were obliged to come up with national targets. And in that process, Sweden said, OK, by 2020, we should reduce our emissions by 40%. We should have a, a, a renewable target saying 50% of our energy mix, which includes the transport sector, should be uh, renewable. Uh, back then, I think we had 38 39% uh, renewable. And then uh, well, the common target of 10% renewable in the transport sector. And then you have the same target as the EU when it comes to energy efficiency. So when it comes to renewable, we already passed it, uh, both in the total uh, energy consumption, but also for transport sector. Uh, I think also what I read is we're going to manage to reduce our emissions by 40% to 2020. When it comes to energy efficiency, well, we're going to manage probably, but only because of the commissioning of the nuclear reactors. But this is a big challenge for us as well. How can we actually be successful on increasing the efficiency in the society? So even if we're going to, yeah, we're going to probably meet the target by, the, by one of the reactors closing before 2020. Because that's its primary energy, so it's including waste heat. But then looking ahead also, we have uh, this, well, 2014, the, again, the European Council, which consists of the Prime Ministers of the EU member states, agreed on new climate and energy targets uh, for 2030, uh, saying 40% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas yeah, emissions, we should at least have 27% of renewables, EUI, and 20% improved energy efficiency. And this is not going to be transposed into the domestic or national objectives, the common objectives, and I'll in a bit show you the you know, actual plan to, to work on, on those objectives. Uh, this is, I think the target objectives can change also what's happening on the EU, uh, the global climate negotiation. The other countries are willing to take up more ambitious targets in their NDCs. Yeah, you can say this is the European NDCs. So uh, coming back to the Swedish government, so when they took office, this government, the government, in fact, in 2014, 
one of the priorities was to find a long-term policy, energy policy agreement in the parliament, which we haven't had for many decades. And so the main task of our minister, Ibrahim Bailan, was to find a kind of agreement. So they established something called the Swedish Energy Policy Commission, which consists of a member of the parliament of all eight political parties. Uh, they're here. Uh, to first do analysis, but then also establishing an agreement on the future and come on, very much come back to the nuclear issue. But the government, when it's about this, they also uh, they want to have an energy system which is 100% based on renewable energy. So this was uh, so actually last month in June, this agreement was uh, reached. Uh, among five of the eight parties, which consists about 75 percent of the seats in the parliament. So this is a long-term view of the future energy policy. And the good thing is actually, because normally you don't hear too much about, when you hear about energy issues, policy in the media, it's all about nuclear, but this actually hopefully can bring some new light to the energy debate of Sweden. And even if a lot of the parties did some compromises, the five parties that which is agreement was kind of the uh, in media seen as uh, the winners, even if they had to make compromises. Uh, this is kind of agreement we need now. We have more and more bipartisan separation uh, here in the U.S. as well, actually showing the citizens that politicians can work together, take decisions on which are important for our future. Uh, so what does it say? Well, same base or same pillars as energy policy today. So aiming for ecological sustainability, competitiveness, security to supply. Uh, but then the objective leading the work is saying that Sweden should have a like, 24 to 5, no net emissions from greenhouse gases. Uh, the target to 2040 is 100% renewable electricity. Uh, by saying that, also it's not a target. It's not it's a target, but it should not be a decision for banning nuclear. So this is, I don't know if you want, in Germany, Two years back, there's a decision to, well, we're going to phase out nuclear until 2022. And this is what the Green Party, which is now in government as well, will do in Sweden. And other parties are divided as well. But saying this, until 2040, there will be no decision to, to, to close the, the, the six remaining nuclear reactors. Uh, which, and we'll come back to the next slide, actually. Um, yeah, so we, during the next year, we're going to have a new energy efficiency target for the 2030. Uh, but coming kind of back on nuclear, so part of the deal is that it's still up to the market if they want to build new nuclear. They can do it in the existing uh, uh, sites. And also to, to uh, one of the reasons why the reactors closed they're getting old, but also the utilities were threatening to close other six reactors too because it's not profitable anymore. So part of that is due to this special tax, the tax on thermal output of nuclear, which now is being phased out. So probably the deal is that the nuclear reactors will run on the 2040. Uh, and then hydro, also there's a lot of environmental requirements to push uh, extra cost on, on the hydro. And the agreement here is also about agreement between the environmental and economic uh, problem, uh, or ethics, actually. And so the property tax will be lowered, but there will be investment ensuring the modernization of the hydro plant. The electricity on renewable, the electricity system will be expanded. Uh, and there will also be uh, special support for offshore wind power to connect saying that the offshore wind power plants don't have to, don't have to uh, pay the, the connection to the national grid. Um, so this is, yeah, I'm not going to go into all of this, but uh, there's a lot of issues. And you can also find that the agreement is seven pages, six, seven pages long on different issues. But really looking at the challenges we're having now and trying to find a compromise which highlights where we have to focus the next time on years. Uh, and and uh, there will also be a uh, parliament between the five different parties that support this. And we'll also have a working group following this work uh, uh, for next year.
So, very short on the EU decision making progress. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but it's very basic. So, uh, you um, you be in Parliament, you will be elected by the citizens. So, every, year, every five years, you have an EU election, so we can blow votes on the different uh, parties. Uh, there's about 700, 800 uh, deputies delegates in the Parliament. So Germany has 100, Malta has 5. Uh, but still, Malta per capita is much higher than Germany, of course. Uh, and then we have the Council of the EU, and this is where consisting of 28 governments. Uh, so at the moment, it's corrupted our social and social democratic and Greek party, the day their agenda, which we are negotiating. Uh, so here we are, uh, and yeah, that's a citizen in each country is like the government, so in that way you have representation. And then we have you complete commission, which is, uh, so if, if the parliament is, is the citizen's interest, the council is the member's interest, and the commission is the union of interest first. Um, I heard someone comparing the council with the, the Senate, and the parliament with the, the House, but yeah, it's kind of similar. Um, because especially when it comes to the competition process, so commission, they put out the proposal and then have to be approved by the council and the European Parliament. Uh, and so as an example, so we have a uh, I'm responsible for a new so EU energy labeling. We're setting a framework for EU labeling, which is like A to G scale on different appliances. Uh, so we had it for 20 years, but now the commission came with a new proposal. Uh, and sent it to the, committee, to the council, the member states, and to the parliament. So the last poll, we had our negotiation and came up with the council's position. And this spring, the European Parliament came up with their proposal. And now we're entering, uh, uh, so that's the first meeting, now we're entering a phase where we're going to negotiate, trying to find an agreement. Uh, so this is what I spend my time on as well. Um, and then we agree on it, it can be adopted, and then it's into it. It's member states. Depending if the directive, member states have to implement it. If it's a regulation, it's direct, uh, active on member states. The uh, European Council is uh, the consist of the leaders of each member state. And they have more like a guiding role, as I mentioned, the 2020 target. Well, now even the target for 2030. And then they give it back to the council to negotiate it. And then, well, the European Court of Justice, so when it comes to implementation of EU legislation, uh, it's not always quite often that the, the, or even compliance with EU legislation in general, uh, member states uh, maybe don't agree with the European Commission on how they implement the uh, legislative act and that goes to the European Court of Justice. Uh, shortly, time flies. Uh, these are the various I think I'm going to say a few words actually on what is comparing. It's really interesting as well to compare what uh, the climate the environment in the EU today compared to like seven, eight years back. So back in 2007, 2008, uh, it was much easier to work on climate and energy. It would be surprising to see what's happening around the world. But today, during the last year, changes in both geopolitically with the situation in Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine. We have seen also the uh, energy costs. I mean, it's very important for many, many member countries. That have high part of the disposal income goes to energy. Uh, we also have, uh, of course, the, the shale gas, shale revolution in North America, with North America, which also a lot of members of the EU see that there's a lot of changes in the global energy markets which open up new opportunities which are cheaper than investing in renewables. Um, I think this has changed a lot, so it doesn't help that the UK will leave the EU as well, because the UK is normally an ally for us as a very pro market integration, pro uh, high ambitions of climate and energy, uh, renewable energy, uh, while other countries are more on the other end. This is the dynamic of the European negotiations, which is 
kind of interesting. But as far as that work for us, the Eurocon Commission as honest broker is really important. Uh, and I don't know my intent to have a very more ambitious agenda than many member states. Uh, and it comes to, so now we're entering uh, the year so 2016, 2017, which we're going to review most of our energy legislation. Uh, so this is a lot of work uh, on, on the future, and much, of course, on the, on the electricity and gas market, but also when it comes to our renewable directive and uh, uh, energy efficiency directives. But this is something you will hear about. This is what we care about. Like this will be the kind of implementation of the climate and energy objectives I showed you before. Uh, and research innovation competition, uh, but it's, it's really a crucial part of it as well. So just a few words uh, on the Sweden global energy engagement. I uh, so I will speak. Um, I will have a perspective from kind of being the part part of the energy department of the ministry. So I'm sure my colleagues working with climate finance or development who would add on even more, but uh, this is more from an energy perspective. But the Paris Agreement last December and the adoption of Agenda 2030 are great successes. I think it's definitely going to lead our work, how we work together within the government to uh, support implementation. Uh, so I think in general, Sweden as well, we have the highest contributor to the Global Climate Fund. Uh, we're also going to raise our support for renewables around the world for a development program. Uh, there is an ambition as well from the government to become one of the first fossil fuel free welfare societies in the world. This is an initiative to gather uh, public and private actors to work together. Um, multilaterally, uh, we work a lot with our Nordic countries, so it's very important for us to see how can international engagement support, complement, supplement our national domestic objectives and priorities. So in order to put the electricity market, market surveillance, we can share the share burden. Uh, on the IA, a lot of analyzes uh, also participate in 20 or so knowledge leverage programs. We're also a very active member of the Clean Energy Net Zero, uh, not a member of all the initiatives, but almost. Uh, and as I was mentioning at the beginning, we also joined the Solution Center and filed to it in, in December last year. And we joined the Mission Innovation Initiative, which also was uh, launched at COP21, and we part of the steering committee here. Bilaterally, bilaterally we uh, kind of we work with uh, both Indonesia, China, India, uh, uh, yeah, South Africa, Turkey, which is building a program with as well. But I think it's uh, get a lot of requests from different countries to work together uh, on sh sharing experiences and doing uh, projects. Uh, as a small government, uh, it's kind of hard to have more programs than a few. So this is actually one of the reasons that we joined the Solution Center, or that joined the Solution Center and came up with this uh, financial contribution to be able to support more countries uh, working on all the MDC, but also to transform their energy sectors. Uh, and our initial focus uh, is on power African countries, Caribbean countries, uh, and Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan will be part of the New York Union. Uh, and spending the last few weeks here, uh, we'll try to figure out that how can we support the Solution Center with more on outreach, how can we bring in more requests from other countries through our like, four missions and the contact we are having with different countries. Uh, we're also we happy to support the experts, just trying to find out that we work in a legal way. Uh, and then finally, uh, so as a government, we are responsible for, for we, we are paying membership to a lot of different national organizations. So of course, we also have an opportunity to be guidance and governance of the different initiatives. I think even here we, we have a task to see how to win the solution center or, or even other programs which I learned about uh, the federal are dealing with how do they fit in, in, the, in the global landscape of different initiatives uh, in, in the way of supporting countries to implement their NDCs. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, 
There are a lot of other, other programs which are starting now, like the Smart Grid and, and on, um, uh, I should have more there. <laughs> there are a lot of things going on. And actually, now I'm working also with my colleagues at RAC in the new uh, build, and it builds the, the next energy research and development program, which will be from 2017 to 2020. And I think part of that is really important with international collaboration. So I think that will be, compared to the last uh, research field, will be more funding for international collaboration. Also, uh, value very much to see what you guys are doing here at Federal. Not only the international program, but also learning more about the domestic program and research you do. That's what I want to say. And thank you for listening. And I didn't really uh, take more time than a hot time. If you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to try to answer. Sure. So thank you very much for uh, the overview. Um, I actually am a, one of the co-leaders of one of the collaboration agreements, the IEA Bioenergy Tab 39, and we focus on liquid biofuels in Sweden as a historically a real champion in the development of particularly ethanol, but also bio, also gas. Um, a lot of diesel on gas, a lot of diesel vehicles on gas, a lot of diesel buses in Stockholm on ethanol with this ED95 uh, ignition booster. But recently, I, there was very little in transport. I looked at the framework. There's transport, fuel, it's just not even mentioned. Uh, it seems to be going backwards on liquid fuels. But What's happened to to liquid fuel development? I think it's a really good question. I think we, I mean, it's still a high priority. I think that's the old saying we have to tackle the challenges with reducing dependence on oil products within the transfer sector. Uh, so we had our experience with ethanol, and uh, it's part of the most, and biogas as well, and really developed well. I think the experience and the, the solutions have been there, and at the market right now, unfortunately, due to low prices, we're really hard to, to sustain that. It's still, I mean, it's still a priority, looking at maybe like the issue of uh, it's not my expertise area, but looking at other, not only electric cars, but actually looking at biofuels as well as an important component of uh, transport fuels. So there will be a lot of research on that as well. Uh, so we have also when we are trying to get EU funding for different projects, uh, it's, it's historically it's been in that in that sector. So and we had it here last year or two years ago, uh, an inauguration of the big biogas plant in Gothenburg, which we're very proud of, but it stands still now because it's still very low prices. Uh, but I think it's still gonna be there. I mean it's not a, something we're giving up. And I think it's over there which we could be better working on internationally as well. Uh, we did something Try to develop something with Brazil uh, a few years ago, but kind of the challenge we having on the EU level as well. Now Sweden, what we see about bioenergy within the EU, it's a lot, doesn't have too much sympathy with Sweden or Finland. Uh, our, I mean, as I was saying, bioenergy is such an important component in our energy mix. Uh, and, but now we're having the last six, seven years on the EU level, we have discussion on criteria for both biofuels and the biomass to the sustainability criteria. And this is also going to kill the European market for some of the fuels. Um, so it's an ongoing battle for us. I mean, I think this is when we are rating like priorities uh, for EU negotiations, bioenergy always at the top and biofuels. But yeah. It's just very tough economically. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much for taking your time, and well, thank you so much for all for hosting me here at uh, Adderall and being so hospitable. Well, that's what we're trying to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, those were great women, by the way. Thank you. A couple last times. Very negligent on. Oh. Uh, 